Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to our next edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. Sydney's luxury property market contains some of the best real estate in the world. Think Point Piper, Rose Bay, Double Bay or Vaucluse with massive waterfront mansions overlooking the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Think Mossman, Cremorne with views back to the city or the Balmoral Slopes with views out to the heads. Or think sprawling estates on the lower and upper North Shore from the leafy suburbs of Roseville, Linfield to Warunga and Warrawee close to those beautiful prestigious private schools. These areas contain the types of real estate that dreams are made of. Yet how does one find these hidden gems and the best opportunities in such tightly held markets? What do luxury buyers really want and where are the buyers coming from? And what is the state of the top end of the market? To provide some timely insights into the world of prestige real estate, we have Darren Curtis from Christie's International with us today. Darren, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. So Darren, we have a little tradition with the Property Buyer Podcast. We start with Thought of the Week, and this one is a quote from Mark Twain. And he says, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. What do you take from that quote? Well, having thought about it, I think he's really saying there for me that time is finite for us. And given the fact that time is finite, it's really important, obviously, to know that you're here. But secondly, perhaps he may be indicating that it's important for us to really try and, within that finite time frame, find out what it is that we want to be doing and really trying to find your place and achieving those things that you as a person are capable of achieving. Awesome. I think it's all about purpose too. I think it's great. You know, I think a lot of people are born and they just float along in life, but I think he's saying you get a direction, have a purpose. That's right. so, That's awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Well, look, let's turn to things real estate. Um, first question off the bat here is what, what inspired you to get into real estate? And, and secondly, how long have you been in the industry and what sort of roles? What was your first role in real estate? So my first role was actually back in November 1999. I just finished university in Canterbury in the UK and um, I was offered to come to an interview in Notting Hill in London. It wasn't something I'd necessarily been looking at doing but it was an opportunity at the time that I couldn't refuse. So there in November 1999 I started selling one and two bedroom flats as we called them in England um, and I was there until 2006. Awesome. Fantastic. Was there anything about real estate that you really enjoyed that kind of attracted you to the game? Well, at the time, I think it was the promise of earning good money. That was certainly the thing that um, garnered my initial attention. But certainly when I got into the job, initially it was the uh, types of personalities I was meeting, both on the buying side and the selling side. And obviously working in Notting Hill, it was an exciting area. The film had just come out and there was a lot going on. There was a real buzz around West London at the time. Fantastic. Sounds like you're a bit of a people person. You love meeting interesting people. Yes, correct. Certainly would in your game. So so you're now at Christie's International. Um, I believe you've worked with Ken Jacobs, who's synonymous with, you know, selling the most expensive real estate. Um, tell me a bit more about your, your current role at Christie's and also just how does Christie's position itself in the Australian real estate market? So yes, that's right. I worked, uh, I began working rather with Ken in March of 2006. So Ken and I had worked together for a good 15 years um, in, in, in the markets that we handle. And now uh, I've taken over Christie's International for New South Wales and Queensland. And I am growing that business on top of the foundations that were laid both by Ken and myself during those 15 years, trying exactly. to expand the brand and raise the public awareness of the brand. Brilliant. That's great. And tell me just maybe one or two little things you've learned from Ken over the years. What has he, what has he taught you in terms of how to, to do your role well? That's a good question. He has always been uh, thoughtful in the approach. Yeah. So he taught me that every property that we are handling will have its own nuance, will have its own 
um, benefits, its own advantages, its own disadvantages, and it's really to handle each property and evaluate what's best for that property rather than uh, applying the same formula to everything that we do. Mm. It's not a cookie cutter um, approach, is it? Correct. Yeah. So we're not volume based as an agency. Yeah. Yeah. And we do have the time to sit down and really decide where's the money coming from, mm. who is our target audience, uh, and every, everything that we do is different. Mm. I mean, I guess in prestige real estate, that's why it's prestige, because it is so unique. I mean, it's its aspect, it could be the size of the property, its privacy, whatever. And I think you've got to apply a particular strategy for each vendor, right, to, to get it across Correct. the line. Whilst all vendors want to know um, where is the best money going to come from? And as an agent, are we able to tap into those markets effectively to produce that desired outcome? Mm, beautiful. Tell me more about the, the suburbs that you consistently cover and, and maybe you could describe a bit of the, the amenity and perhaps the, the demographics of those suburbs that you look after. Sure, I guess one very important detail about us as an agent agency is we are not defined by geography. Right. So agents all across Sydney, in fact, all across all of the major towns and cities in Australia, if not worldwide, the agents will cover their patch. We are the reverse of that in that we don't have any specific area that we specialise in. What connects our stock is that they are at the top end of any market. So I may be selling in the Blue Mountains, I may be selling in Point Piper, I may be selling in Warunga, you may find me in Terry Hills. It's all about the property. Mm. And I think that's what really stands us apart. Whilst, yes, I may not do as many sales in one specific area, I am doing as many sales at the top end as anybody else. So you're in the top 5% of pretty much any suburb in New South Wales or Queensland, right? It'd be hard to put an exact, within what percentage do my homes that I work on sit in, but I'd say sure. it, at least that. I mean, we are fortunate to have achieved some suburb records over the time. So they are the top mm. percentage of those mm. suburbs. But yeah, perhaps three or 5%. So it's a really niche market that you're targeting. It's a really cra really cool business model. I really like it because like you say, they're not, you're not restricted by geography like a franchise no. is. You, you can go anywhere Correct. and just pick the cream of the crop properties. That's wonderful. And, but describe to me maybe just some of the suburbs you've sold in and, and what are they like? Oh, well, look, um, let's have a look. Recently, I've been doing quite a bit on the Upper North Shore. I actually live myself in St. Ives. So I do from Kalara, Pimble, Warrawee, Warunga, those sorts of suburbs. Mm. They, compared to the eastern suburbs, they are able to offer much more space as a value proposition. Mm. Obviously, since 2012, I have seen a real growth in the demand for those areas, particularly from overseas buyers, which I'm sure we'll get to mm. later. But you have these sort of half acre, acre, two acre estates, which really give people the opportunity, particularly more children, to just spread out. They have tennis courts, they have swimming pools, they have maybe 400, 500, 600 square meters internally. And you simply wouldn't get that here in the East. You wouldn't get that in Mossman for the types of money perhaps that these homes are selling for. Mm -hmm. So I like those areas. Then if you take that to the next level on space versus money, then you arrive in suburbs like Terry Hills, Duffy's Forest. So another 20 minutes north, let's say. There I can get you for similar money, five acres mm -hmm. with a thousand square meters house, perhaps with stables. Mm -hmm. And really over the last six months, perhaps 12 months, we've seen some extraordinary sales where people have recognised the value, which you might think it takes a long while to drive, but I do a thousand Ks a week <laughs> and 40 minutes really to that mm. Sydney acreage. Mm. I think Dural is about to follow, Kenthurst is about to follow, yeah. but those, those over the 12 months have been of particular interest too. Fantastic, me. yeah, great. I mean, the East has some pretty impressive suburbs like Bellevue Hill, Vaucluse. I mean, Bellevue Hill's median prices, I think it's just hit over $9 million this year. Um, how, how do you describe the top suburbs of the east? How do you, what sort of words do you describe them as? The eastern suburbs, it is pure supply and demand. Mm. It's my understanding there are fewer than 300 waterfront homes in the eastern suburbs. There is no more space to build more. That's why we continually see the building work going on. And of course, prime eastern suburbs is in the highest demand. Mm. And therefore we've seen the prices just continue to go from strength to strength. Yeah. And I personally don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Is there a, a way you categorise pricing and, and, or use a particular vernacular in the prestige market? For example, like is, is five to 10 million called luxury, is 10 to 30 called prime luxury, is, is 30 to 50 called super, is 50 plus ultra prime? Like, is there a particular vernacular that you use? I don't think there's a certain vocabulary and it will depend from suburb to suburb. Mm. So I remember 
uh, if I set a record in the Blue Mountains, that might come in at three or four million. Now, of course, if you come here to the east, then it needs to be, as we've seen now, 100 million, 130 million. So, no, I, w I would call that sort of top end, just the luxury end. Mm. If you had to pin me down on a price, I would mm. say, in my own mind's eye in the eastern suburbs, 15 million plus mm. for the luxury. Mm. Um, but of course, to get on the water now, three or four years ago, we were saying, well, you can't get on the water now for 50 million. Now it's really, it's approaching 100, mm. 80 yeah. million, 90 yeah. million. Yeah. You will read and hear mm. about more of these sales over mm. time. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. So we've just had a, a really interesting year, 2023, um, just passed. It's been a challenging year for a lot of home buyers and people in the market because interest rates have been high, which perhaps doesn't affect the top end as much. But what do you think, how would you describe 2023 and, and what sort of factors do you think influence the market, particularly at the top end? For me, again, it just comes back to supply and demand. You are correct. The luxury end or the top end of the market really has not seen any impact from the rise in interest rates. I live two very different lives. I have my personal life where I have, yes, I have noticed the rise in interest rates on the mortgage and that sort of thing. But really at work with the buyers that I meet, the vendors that I talk to, we have not seen that impact. A lot of the people that I am dealing with are financing because they want to, not because they need to. And there has been an overriding desire to get into these suburbs. And they're hard workers, they may be business owners, they may be overseas buyers. The one thing they all have in common is they have the capacity, they have the capability. And Australia continues to become a blue chip destination for those overseas people. Mm. My understanding is in past decades, Australia its location, its geographical position was seen as a disadvantage. But in recent times, that same geographical position is now seen as an advantage. <laughs> it is a safe, secure, stable Western democracy, which particularly, as we know, has been heavily uh, influenced by the arrival of the mainland Chinese really since 2012. Mm. And this demand has created the price rises that we've seen over mm. those years. Mm. It's always, I mean, whenever I travel overseas and I fly back into Sydney Harbour and see the bridge in the Opera House, I go, this wonderful feeling, I'm home, you know. I mean, I've been to Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and look, great cities, but the smog, the traffic, the intensity of everything, it's just, it's overwhelming. So I think I can understand why a lot of buyers really choose Australia to park their money, as you say, because it's a stable Western democracy. And I think it's going to be a trend that's going to continue. Correct. Yeah. And I deal with the mainland Chinese every day. They're driving factors, I'm told, are the education for the children, the clean air, the blue skies, and the blue water. Mm. This is what's driving them. Now, they're intrinsic to Australia. They're things that aren't going to change, and they're things that really draw and drive the mainland mm. Chinese mm. to come here. Mm. So putting your crystal ball out there, thinking ahead 2024, um, what's your predictions, expectations as we head into the, the, the market for next year, particularly again, the top end? You know? my, my instinct, my feeling is it will just continue. The demand will continue to grow. We may see a slowing of the growth, but stock this year has been quite tight. There hasn't been that flood of stock that was expected perhaps at the start of the spring selling quarter. So I just think it'll be business as normal. We have Chinese New, Com New Year coming up uh, next year, I think on Saturday the 10th of February. So that will be our next major intake of mainland Chinese. And here in the eastern suburbs, we can see again that the stock levels are low. And my inquiry level, I'm very privileged, my inquiry level when I set a new apartment or a new home to market is always very high. So if you talk about the top end in isolation, I think it will continue to grow. Mm, yeah, I think we've just had announcements the last couple of weeks around the skilled migration program being revamped and sort of fast tracking particularly highly skilled workers, particularly industries. And they might, you know, they rent for a year, maybe two, but they're going to want to buy at some point, particularly if they're well paid. So I think that migration factor will also have a flow on effect to the top end of the market, would you I, agree? Yeah, I do. And I should also add that this year, for the majority of the year, we have seen a weaker Australian dollar. Now, whether you're an expat, whether you're a mainland Chinese who earns US dollar, 
it has been a really good time for you to buy. Mm. I've been with several expats this year, all earning US dollar, and there was a point during the year, I can't remember exactly when, where they weren't doing anything, yet they were able to purchase more Aussie dollar for their money. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, that, that's a great, that's a really good point, uh, Darren, because the, the leverage you get through the currency play, I mean, I, I deal with a lot of the international banks and we, they talk about multi-currency loans for, for some of the expat clients. And it's often difficult for some expats to get loans because the banks tend to wash off a lot of their serviceability. They discount it by 30, 40% sometimes. But as you point out, if the currency is low, it just makes the buying much more competitive, uh, much better value. So it is a, a really good time for them to think about entering into the market. Um, tell me more about luxury buyers and, and how they approach the real estate game. Like in other words, what, tell me more about what do the prestige buyers want? What are the features that they're looking for? You mean from the actual properties they're looking to yeah, buy? Yeah, the features, the properties themselves. Yeah. Okay, look, everybody is different, but if I had to pick general trends on what people want, I would say top of the tree comes views, mm -hmm. water views. Many of the international buyers or the returning expats, as you say, coming home, they want to know they're here. Now, of course, that is often highlighted if you're looking at the icons, the bridge, yeah. the opera house, so certainly they are at the top of the tree. Yeah. And then if you step back, water views, waterfront, of course they're popular. Aspect is very important to people. People want to be north facing, northeast facing. Some have some northerly exposure. Yeah. And then really it depends from each family circumstance, of course, tennis courts, lawns, gardens can be a big draw card. Some of the mainland Chinese would prefer lower maintenance blocks, mm. particularly if they're not here all the time. They know mm. that they're gonna have somebody looking after that property for mm. them. Yeah. But essentially it focuses around aspect, water views, facility. Mm. They for me would be the... What about the privacy? Thing. I'm sure privacy would be a big feature for a lot of people and security. Like they wanna be in a low crime, you know, uh, really, really top amenity environment, I'd imagine. For sure, and again, that. For me, that would vary from suburb to suburb. Mm. If you're looking to buy in Point Piper, you are cheap by jowl next to somebody else. Mm. That's just the way it is. Mm. Security in those things, sure, it's important, but a lot of that stuff is taken care of post-purchase. Yeah. Those are the sorts of things you can adjust, you can adapt, mm. you can make your own. Mm. The three things that I spoke about, aspect, mm. waterfront, views, you cannot change. Mm. These are intrinsic. Mm. So once you have those set, the personal detailing around the property can be done afterwards. I've seen a lot of properties in these myself and, and there's just a real lack of privacy. Like fantastic home, beautiful Very street, difficult. but you've got your neighbour looking at you. So you can't have a private party without knowing that they're watching you. you know? Whereas, Correct. as you pointed out before, you know, places out like Terry Hills or the Northern Beaches or Upper, upper North Shore Warunga, you've got you know, triple blocks, 2,000, 3,000, five acre blocks, for example, in Terry Hills, that you can get that privacy. So I think, some buyers, I think, uh, well, that really want that will we'll go, you know what, I'm actually going to move out there. So, no, you're exactly right. If we were sitting here maybe two years ago and you asked me, Darren, what are the top sales outside of the eastern suburbs? Mm. I think I would have listed to you the old Chisholm property in Palm Beach, I mm. think sold for around 24. We were fortunate to sell the Hawkins house in Newport yep. for 24 and a half. And then I think there was a home in uh, Balmoral in Mossman that sold for 25. Mm. Those two or maybe three years ago, they were the top three sales outside of the eastern suburbs. Mm -hmm. Now, however, if you ask me the same question, I can say to you that we had a sale in, we, the world of agency, had a sale in Lavender Bay at 42. Clontarf's record is now 33. Mm -hmm. Terry Hills is now 24 and a half. Middle Jural is now 14. Mm -hmm. So we have seen this spillover mm -hmm. from the eastern suburbs mm -hmm. and Mossman where the list of sales, even now in Warrawee, we mentioned mm. earlier, mm. Uh, there is a house sale at over 20 million in Warrawee. It's a friend of mine, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've been to his house. Fabulous. He's got an ama it's an amazing property. I know, I know it very well. It's, it's um, incredible, the 14 car garage. The, the builder on that put in some phenomenal amount of concrete. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so yeah. I think there are probably, well, clearly there are people that have recognized, maybe COVID acted as a catalyst, I'm not mm. sure, mm. that you can achieve yeah more space for your money. There are value propositions to be had. Now, as an agent, I'm fortunate, as we've already discussed, I don't have any geographical boundaries. If you came to me and said, Darren, I have 20 million to spend, or 15 million to spend, or 35 million to spend, I can show you genuinely mm. what you get in Rose Bay, what you get in Warunga, what you get in Hunters Hill, what you'll get in Terry Hills, mm. and you pick one. 
They all offer different things. And I think there has been a category of people who have chosen to be that bit further out. That's not taking away that the Eastern Suburb still has the highest demand, no question. But there is a growing number of people who have thought, you know what, I prefer the space. Yeah. I've just mm. recalibrated the record in Eleonora Heights. Mm. Close to 16 million now. If I showed you that house and you saw the views, the land size mm. is an extraordinary purchase. Mm. Now that buyer recognised that, and I'm sure more will follow. So it's it's, it's interesting. been an interesting interesting road. yeah. I'm curious to know just just on the same question, just how luxury buyers think in terms of the way they approach buying real estate. Do they do they look at it more from um, this is just purely a lifestyle decision, or do some of them go this is more an investment decision? You know what? If I hold this for 10, 20, 30 years, I'm going to make money. And I just think back to a client that I helped buy a beautiful property, a waterfront in Fairfax Avenue in Mossman. Mm -hmm. And my client came to me, he'd fallen in love with the property. So he engaged me to negotiate it. I got him a great deal. This is back in 2008 or whenever it was, 2009. He paid, I think around $8 million for it at the time, which was a pretty decent price for Mossman back in that day. Um, that same property today is worth about 18, maybe 20 million. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said to me, because I showed him the capital history of capital growth, and, and he said to me, Rich, if I buy this property, I'll be set for life. I said, absolutely. I said, you're in a very privileged position. But do tell me, do, do the buyers think of it as an investment or a lifestyle choice? If I had to pick, I would go lifestyle choice. I think there are two types of buyer. There are the emotional buyer, and there is the analysis, the person yeah. that is doing the numbers. Yeah. Very often, I'm not going to sell to that person. Yeah. I'm looking acting for the vendor, I'm looking for the person who, the with whom I am able to generate that emotional connection. Now, I'm fortunate that much of the stock I sell will generate that emotional yes. connection. Right. So on the face value for the kids and the wife and the day-to-day -day living, it's definitely the emotion. I'm sure at the back of the mind they'll be thinking, how's this going to work for me long term? But I have to say, I think the emotion will override for that immediate short-term decision to mm. move in. They love the house yeah, yeah. and they'll pay the money. The mindset's very different if you have a, you're fortunate to have that sort of budget mm. where you can allocate funds to make sure the purchase can happen. Um, I, do, I do think the emotional, the emotional drive is most important, mm. particularly when you're dealing at that end of the market. So we touched it briefly before on expats and, and foreign buyers. Do you deal with many expats and foreign buyers and, and where are they coming from and what do they want to buy? So a mixture, yes I do deal with them. I've just sold um, a property in Greenwich, a uh, suburb, um, not spot. far from the city, unvalued suburb I think. It's, um, it's got a lovely village, English village feel to it, hasn't it? Absolutely, and they, yeah. they, I, I did have the suburb yeah. record though, I have just lost yeah. it, but um, um, yeah. they uh, were coming from Dubai, Australians, children of year seven school age coming home, they see it, they've done the work overseas, they've earned the money and Actually, they're not due back for another 18 months, but again, from overseas, they've been looking at the Sydney market. They can see the strength in the Sydney market, the demand in the Sydney market, and decided to make that move now, particularly added to that with the currency. Mm. So they have now rented that out, but they've put their foot on a waterfront with some astonishing views. What I felt was relatively good buying, it needs work, but as a long-term value proposition, it's very good for them. Mm. So there's a mixture of expats. I was with someone from the UK, again, coming home, children of school age, looking for acreage, yeah. daughters into horses. Mm. He's purchased up uh, in Ingleside, which mm. I actually I think is the next yep. acreage suburb that Beautiful, people should yeah. be looking. Uh, yeah. Duffy's and Terry Hills have already gone, but Ingleside yeah. I think will be next. Yeah. Uh, and then the majority of the overseas purchases that I'm dealing with are mainland Chinese. Okay. Um, I deal with them every day. And I have done now for, well, more than 10 years. Apart from China, is there any other kind of countries they're coming from? In UK, Malaysia, Singapore? No, the the Vietnam, I have noticed an increase in inquiry. India, I have noticed a yes. small increase in inquiry. Mm. Mm. South Africa is always quite steady. Yeah. But if I pick 10 buyers, I would say that um, the mainland Chinese comprise eight of those buyers. Yes. And the remainder of the countries are probably the last two. Okay. And when someone's a foreign buyer or an expat buyer, how do you explain the buying process to someone who's never transacted in Australia? Is, is, do they tell you their budget um, and, and, and share that or, or how, do they, how do they go about it? I think for them it's a learning curve. So initially 
let's take the mainland Chinese, they will offer up a budget mm. to understand what it is that they can get. So I have five million to spend, could you show me what I can get? They see what they can get, it's not quite what they need, I will then be told, well I can now spend 10. Mm. And I have had examples where that person will then end up spending 25. Mm. So I think for them and for us together, we are in a learning curve. Yeah. The actual buying process, because of the restrictions of buying in Australia, the visas that are required, you must be a permanent resident, um, sorry, you must be a temporary resident at the minimum, permanent to save yourself the extra stamp duty. A lot of those buyers that I'm meeting have already gone through that process. Mm. They've secured their visa, they've taken 18 months to do that, then they come and see someone like me, they're ready to buy, yeah. to write the cheque, to purchase the home. Um, so budget, budget's flexible, fluid at this end of the market. Yeah. Great. It's really a learning curve for both sides. And again, I have to say, Australia, although we here internally see it as being very expensive, well, I certainly do, compared to other overseas cities, it is actually still relatively good buying. Mm. If you look at some of the rates per square metre they might achieve in Shanghai, as you mentioned, it's extraordinary. Mm. So as an agent, I have to remind myself continually that these guys already know what expensive real estate is. Mm. And if they're looking at waterfronts in Point Piper or in Hunters Hill or anywhere, they are still feeling that it's relatively, relatively mm. good buying. And they might be using a metric, or a New York buyer, for example, might be using a per square foot measure compared to yeah. like, yeah. it's really super cheap. We really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast, and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family and colleagues and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links. And now let's get back to the podcast. Um, I'd love to talk more about the eastern suburbs market for a moment if we may. Um, just love to know, are you seeing any trends that are happening in the eastern suburbs in terms of types of buyers or, or particular property types that are in high demand in the east? Um, the Torrens title, freehold house, is certainly, people are paying big premiums, even for what I might consider relatively small land holdings, just to get into the suburb. Mm. So they want to be just in the suburb, even if the property now needs work. I've noticed there is this sort of general cliche that mainland Chinese only prefer new. Mm. I've seen them buying older stock now, so compromising on the condition of the immediate purchase just to get into the suburb, just to get that block of land. So it's the land mm. that they have their eye on. Um, so that's certainly something that's become stronger. It's always the case, of course, yes. the Torrance title home, freehold house, but a real push for that. And this is why we've seen the rise in prices. Mm. Some extraordinary prices being mm. achieved for relatively small blocks in these prime locations. Mm, fantastic. And there's always building works going on. I mean, I drive around everywhere in the Easter, there's always a always. tradie vans and cranes and everything going on. In those 17 years that I have been here, um, it's never changed. Mm. It's always continuing, mm. always. And I, I can't see any reason why it will ever end. It's mm. always been the same. And this goes back to the point that space is limited, mm. land is limited, mm. but demand continues to increase. So once someone puts their foot on that block of land, then the build begins. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Tell me a little bit about how you go listing a property for a vendor. How do you decide what price is realistic and, and potentially relevant in the current market? We are fortunate in that I would have to say all, if not close to all of our work is referral based. So we, we, we will get called in as the referral and like any agent, any agency, we are looking for comparable evidence, building a case as to why a property, be it an apartment or a house, might be worth what we will end up asking. So it's really that uh, case by case, using all the information that's very easily uh, available to us all on public record. Now, in my job and the things that we sell, very often there aren't the comparable evidence. There, there aren't those tangible things that we can say, well, this one sold for this, well, this one sold for that, because there isn't another one. Yeah, yeah. So that has its pros and its cons. So what I normally do is I might look at, the first port of call is replacement cost. Yep. So Darren, if I wanted to buy this block of land, 
on the current rates per square meter, and then I wanted to build the house on top of it, what sort of money are we looking at? Mm. So that's usually the starting point, the replacement. What would it cost me to build this today for myself? Mm. Um, and then we would relay that advi uh, advice to the vendor and mm. move on from there. And are you having any tricky conversations with vendors around pricing? Are they kind of, are they greedy? Are they ambitious or are they realistic? Or do you get a combination of all three? Well, as we always say, <laughs> nothing adds value like ownership, but Look, while this conversation, obviously things are sounding very rosy in the luxury end of the market, over the last 12 weeks, things have tightened slightly, mm. traditional for the time of year. But I think that um, if the vendor's motivation isn't sufficient and there is perception that the price isn't going to be achieved, then they will hold back. Mm. So with those vendors at the moment, it's probably not worth them giving themselves that exposure to the market if they're not going to be at the price. Yeah. If the motivation is there, there is absolutely no question that each home that I'm marketing, we could sell today. So the demand is there. But just recently, it's whether that demand does reach the expectation. If you have a vendor who's been in a home for 25 years, there isn't that drive to sell, but there's a feeling they're not going to get the price, then they will withdraw, which in turn then stifles our stock supply. <laughs> which perversely increases the price of everybody else. Correct, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's difficult. But yeah. the, you know, the, the job at our end and the clients that we deal for, we are trying to give genuine advice. Mm. You know, we do get paid fees mm. and really trying to take that as an advisory role rather than mm. just simple turnover. Yep. Yep. It's very important. I want to talk about off-market property with you and, and we do a lot of off-market as you know with a lot of agents and uh, we've, we've done transactions with yourself. But, um, in the eastern suburbs and the North Shore, a lot is sold off market. What do you think of the pros and cons of that approach for, for everyone? I think that, uh, well, as background, out of, let's again pick 10 deals, I probably do between two and four off market. Mm -hmm. So quite a high proportion, mm -hmm. I think, compared to um, the majority of the, 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 the market. I think from the buying side, certainly uh, the advantage is that you're maybe not having to compete with as many buyers, particularly if it's something which we will be in high demand, north facing aspect, waterfront views, the icons. So if you can ga gain access into something off market, of course, it's going to work for you. Mm. Disadvantage is that even as a buyer, well, as a buyer, you may have to pay a premium to persuade the vendor not to go to public marketing. If they're not at a premium, why wouldn't the vendor just go public? Mm. So there could be some wrangling, of course. Mm on market, off market, but off market with price. Mm -hmm. From the selling side, look, I think it's simply that the vendor knows that they have realized the maximum value. Mm. It's, if you show one buyer, you get a good price, the automatic vendor's reaction, well, hang on, if we've seen shown one buyer, mm. what happens if I show 10? Mm. Now, there may be merit in that thought, but it's a conversation I normally have prior to showing anyone that if we're gonna get a price from buyer one that you would have been happy with at the end of a campaign, mm. then you should seriously consider it. Why not take it up front? Because those other buyers might have expectations well lower. Mm. And very often, mm. even on market, and I think most agents would agree, some of your very best buyers will come through first. This week, exactly. They are the first exactly buyers, they right. are the buyers who are looking, they mm. are the buyers that are getting the alerts, they're on the market, they, they know what's happening. They're motivated. But mm. They're motivated. And so they'll come through the front door first. Mm. It's just making sure the vendor is cognizant of that, mm, yeah. that they understand that. Yeah. In those first few years of being here, I had examples where I'd brought the first buyer through, they'd made a great offer, we didn't transact, and we, well, we looked back and we did regret it. Mm -hmm. So those conversations are much clearer now with the vendors prior to anyone coming through. It's often the best time to have it. Brilliant. So we mentioned about the lack of listings at the moment. What's holding vendors back from listing properties for sale? Do you think these are valid or rational reasons at the moment? I think at the moment, yes. I think um, there, is, there is some concern over what will happen next year, particularly at the lower end of the market. So that'll be one reason if they're not realising the price. The second thing, perhaps most importantly, that I experience is that the vendor doesn't know where to go. So if they sell their house, they're gonna be left out of the market. Nobody wants to be left out of the market. Mm. And if stock is in short supply, well, where do I go, Darren? Mm. So unless there is a definite reason, you know, I have people who go down to the Highlands, I have people 
you know, perhaps there's been a, a divorce, maybe there's been a death in the family. Mm. So definite reasons to sell. Mm. If those aren't present, then the vendor is left scratching their head. Well, even if you get me a premium price, I'm going to be up the street. I, do, I, I can't spend the money. <laughs> so I think this this is a mm. Sydney is not a big place. Mm. There aren't many homes. Mm. So if someone doesn't have that clear, defined path to go down, mm. then they will just stay put. Yep. Um, because long term, they know the investment's good to have. Yeah. Um, I call it the great Mexican standoff. You know, yes. I'd love to sell my house, but where am I going to go? Correct. I mean, that's where we come in as buyers agents. You know, we that's where we love working with agents. We say, look, we'll further than us, and we'll we'll go and find the next one. And then we often do, and then we get we make the whole transaction happen on yeah, both the, that's the buyer and the sale side. That's right. So, mm, yeah. And what about buyers? What, what's holding buyers back? Do you think at the moment? I think again. I don't think you can generalise at the top end of the market, mm. holding buyers back might just be, they just haven't found that place they're emotionally yeah, connected with. Not the right one. Okay, it's just not the right one. Yeah. At the lower end, there may be an internal hope that the market's going to come off <laughs> and that they'll be able to buy... The perennial hope for a crash and buy it for cheaper. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, yeah. God's not making any more waterfront, as they say. You know? Correct. So, But I think... All of those people that I deal with, all the people that actually purchase, all the people that sell, once they've made the decision and they have transacted, nobody regrets it. Mm. So for those buyers who demonstrate concern of the market to me, I always ask them, why are we here looking? Mm. Wait till that comes off. But mm. I don't think in these price ranges it's going to. Mm. And once we've got over that hurdle and they find something that they're emotionally connected mm. with, they purchase, and any of those guys that I call today, they'll all be over the moon that they bought. I'm curious, um, do many prestige buyers buy with cash or well, sorry buy with a mortgage or are they buying with cash so the exposure i have to that i would have to say to you that in my time here i've actually only transacted three deals where a mortgage was required for purchasing mm. so clearly almost all of everything i do the cash buyers cash purchases yeah. I mean, it's all cash to the vendor but they are financing post purchase mm. Mm. again as i said earlier because they want to, not because they need to. Yes. Yeah. So at the top end, as far as I'm concerned, in my experience, all cash purchases. That's interesting. Um, I want to ask you about negotiations, because that's always a, an interesting topic uh, to pick your brain on. I'm sure Ken's taught you a few tricks of the trade there, but how do you approach the negotiation process with a buyer? And, and, on, and equally, how should buyers approach you as a sales agent to get a good outcome? So the main thing for me is clarity. So being as transparent, and as clear with buyers as I possibly can be. So what does that look like? Unpack that for me. So it all starts, and again, bearing in mind we're not volume based, so it all starts with generating that emotional connection. In terms of auctions and method of sale here at the agency, I've actually only um, been required to do five or six auctions in those 15 years. So most of the things that I'm selling are either via expressions of interest or private treaty. Yeah. So there's two things. One, I know the buyer has the budget, be it 10 million, 20 million. We've done that in the qualification process prior to the inspection. Secondly, they love the house. Mm. So essentially what I'm looking for in my transactions is, Darren, I like the house, what do I need to do? Mm. So the negotiation is almost all done. It's, the pricing is often the last thing I'm discussing, the actual mm. negotiation. Mm. How much is the house? It's 20. I'll offer you 18. Mm -hmm. And we do a deal at 19. Mm -hmm. That's how the vast majority of my deals work. And what about when there's a competitive buying situation where you've got multiple offers? How do you, how do you deal with that? Do you put a deadline on it? Do you say best and final? How do you do it? Yeah, so again, case by case basis. I don't have a, a blanket approach, mm -hmm. but the majority of that sort of outcome is that we have what we might term a formal tender. So in order to protect the vendor, I won't put anything public out there but I will inform those three or four interested groups that we are closing in a very specific way on a specific date and time yeah. with a best and final. Yeah. There is no second stage the way we handle it. Yeah. It is the end of the negotiation, not the beginning. Yeah. Now, again, it's credibility on my side as long as all the buyers believe me, they understand the instructions, it all goes through the solicitors, mm. then I will generate a higher outcome for my vendor. Mm. Perhaps even than a public auction would do, mm. because the public auction is only ever set by second place bidder. Mm. If the second place stops, there's no reason for the first place to carry on. Mm. Where in the situation I might set up on behalf of the vendor, there may be, well, 
hundreds of thousands of dollars difference between first and second place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's more applicable to the stock that I sell. Mm. So again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. could be a private auction, it could be a formal tender, mm. or it could just be a simple private treaty mm. negotiation. I really like the fact you talk about transparency because I find my dealings with agents, it works so much better when we all know where we stand with each other. Instead Correct. Instead of this cloak and dagger and agents not calling me back, that's just, it's ridiculous, you know. But if agents are clear with me, it just gets a much better outcome for both parties. Correct. You know? And I think the reason... That's worked best for us in our experience is that a lot of my vendors, and in fact, a lot of my buyers, they have seen people like me, sales agents, over the years. They've been around the block far more times than mm -hmm. I have. So it's just better to be straight, mm. clear, yeah. simple, and we get the job done. Tell me about an intriguing or, or your most memorable, maybe interesting and intriguing sale. Give, give us a little insight into the world of, of Darren Curtis's sales. What's, what's, <laughs> <laughs> tell me some interesting ones you've done. Well, I was fortunate enough to sell the oldest house ever to be offered in Australia. Yeah. Uh, it was from actually from 1812. Oh, wow. And my vendor at the time was the um, Historic Houses, um, Sydney's Historic Houses Trust. Uh, I think the Sydney Living Museums today. Um, and they had rescued Glenfield, which was the house down by Casula um, on the way to Liverpool. Um, and they had restored it to the way in which the heritage architect felt it would have been presented in 1812. We were fortunate enough to dress it with furniture. I think it's called campaign furniture. Campaign in the sense you would be able to fold chairs and tables into chests of drawers which fit easier on the ship wow. at that time. Wow. So there was a company in the Cotswolds who we actually got to furnish the property. Mm. So not only was the exterior authentic, restored by Historic Houses Trust, mm. but also dressed internally wow. the way in which it would have been. Mm. And funnily enough, that buyer came, was a heart surgeon at Liverpool, but lived in Edgecliffe, was fed up of the commute, and so picked up three acres with mm. arguably uh, one of Australia's most significant homes, mm. uh, much closer wow. to work. Fantastic. So that was a good one that Wonderful. I remember. Yeah, yeah. But whether I've been directly involved, involved or on the sidelines with mm. some of the, you know, seeing fair water, mm that Ken transacted a few mm. years ago, or some of those major Sydney What did Fairwater sell for again? 100. 100 yeah. So that was the first yeah. house uh, to sell for that level. Mm. Well, there are only two now, but that was the first one. Um, so being um, able to access mm. and experience those homes, mm. put all the listing and selling aside, but actually just to see some of these homes yeah. has been very special and for it, me. And uh, was he involved in Altona as well? He was. He was, yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So what's been the most expensive property you've sold? Personally, mm. um, I was involved in Seven Hillside last year, or maybe that was 2021, that was 35 million. Mm -hmm. There was a couple that year, Bellevue Hill, there was two to four Tarrant Avenue that we sold mm. uh, for 25 and a half million. So there's been a cluster of those sales between 20 and 30 million, mm, and then um, mid 30s. But most of my work, mm. I think if we sat down and worked out the average sale price, it's a little around 10 million, yeah. a little over 10 million. Fantastic. It's mostly what I do. Awesome. So I've got two more questions for you, then you're yeah. off the hook. Um, are you, uh, tell us about your own experience in buying property. Are you an active property investor yourself? No, <laughs> is the answer. I, obviously coming from the UK, it took me a few years to get my head around being in Australia, so far away from what I might term home. Um, so I have property in England and um, I hadn't, got into the rhythm of doing that here, but I have now. Yes. So right. um, I have three children. Yeah. We have our own home in St. Ives, and I am looking, for me at the moment, I think important, we've already touched it in this conversation, is the land. Mm. It's the land that's been... It's the land content that drives value. Always. Yeah, absolutely. And so we are looking mm. Um, mm. down south. I like the south coast. Mm. Um, yeah. Perhaps for some acreage where we can build, yeah. um, but it is something which 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 over the next few years. I want the children to be able to enjoy. Wonderful. And um, you know, within a couple of hours of Sydney, so I'm not too far away. Fantastic. Yeah. And last question, could you share maybe a piece of investment, the best piece of investment advice you've ever received? Uh, well, not wanting to sound cliched, but I think you would always look for those elements that I know buyers are looking for. So if I pick the last, thousand buyers that I've dealt with mm. and we filter down the main things that they have asked for and we put that into a circle, I would definitely say 
but the waterfront, mm. the north facing, it's huge. People talk to me about it almost every day. Mm. So if I was out there mm. purchasing, those are the sorts of elements, those main factors. That you know the features that attract the buyer Correct. and you know what's going to increase the value and that's Correct. the thing you'd buy. And I, I, yeah. I always see what people are. Yeah. I understand what people need. We t again, we touched on it earlier where the internal personalized things can always be changed. Yes. Right? Even the house can be knocked over. And Australians are very keen. They don't hesitate in knocking a house over and building a new one. But it's where that block is. It's how that block faces. Yeah. It's how it sits, very important, the things that you cannot change. Absolutely. And so these are the, clearly, if you're looking at an investment part near the station, near the shops, walk to rail, all that kind of stuff, yes. But when you take the steps up, it's those other factors that sort of come into, yeah. into, in, 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 into account. You've into just thinking. articulated exactly what's on my website, on my top 20 criteria there without even knowing it. So right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but I always say to clients, you know, once you've bought the block of dirt, you can't move it. That's right. right. But you can change cosmetically anything about them, as you say, or knock it down. But Absolutely. once it's the location, yes. that's the premium driver. And then it's features within that. I mean... In, within each suburb, there are particular local features that some people want. As you say, it might be aspect, it might be a you know, position to a school or a shop or a community village or something like that. But knowing what attracts buyers in an area and what increases the value is very, very valuable information for any property investor out there to, to consider that. So. Yes. Well, Darren Curtis, uh, thank you so much no, for no, your time you. today. Uh, it's been very, very educational. I hope uh, our listeners will, I'm sure they're going to get great value, but thank you again for coming on the Property Buyer Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Rich Harvey. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on another edition and we'll say bye. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates, weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer Podcast.